Okay, so today we're going to start the session number three for Foundation Automatic Technology Unit number six. So if you can remember what we discussed so far, we have discussed, we were been discussing the uh, drive train, automobile drive train. So up to now we have discussed about the transaction or oh, we'll start from the drive train, what is the drive train and uh, up to like um, operations, the manual and automatic transmissions. Uh, transactions and flywheel. So today we're going to discuss about the rest of the components that includes the clutch, uh, the propeller shaft or the drive shaft, the propeller shafts, the um, uh, and final drive and the differential. In addition to that, automated manual transmission also we expected or I expected to actually discuss with you. So we'll go ahead and uh, sorry. Okay, so we'll start with the clutch assembly. So usually in um, when we are discussing about the clutch, we usually say it's just the clutch, but the clutch is uh, assembly, the clutch, the whole purpose, the purpose of the clutch, if we consider about the purpose of the clutch, it's just to uh, 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 allow the engine to be, there's a small mistake here. Uh, so what it actually does is it's allow to disengage, not dismantle, disengage, allow the engine to be disengaged from the transmission, rest of the components of the transmission when it's necessary and protect the drive line component. So those see, those are the two main functions, but, uh, uh, but uh, uh, it does not only perform by the clutch, it's actually performed by the clutch uh, assembly so clutch assembly includes the clutch plate or the clutch we usually call it as a clutch as well as the pressure plate and the throwout bearing or throwout bearing and all the other components that is necessary to properly function the clutch right so all the components shown here actually comes under the clutch assembly right comes under the clutch assembly i know that you have a, uh, we all have a very good idea how the clutch actually works but uh, I don't know whether you are very much familiar about the purposes of the clutch. I know you know why the clutch is needed. We usually talk about this uh, disassembling, the, not disassembling, actually disengaging the engine from the transmission itself is the main function of the um, clutch. But there's another one additional functions that clutch perform that's actually protect the drive life components by slipping. So let me try to give you an example. So assume that uh, you put like uh, for, let's say a car or a van or something, and you take, uh, you put like a, a, a big load, right? Huge load on that, uh, okay, let's say it's a small truck. So and then small truck, you put like few, uh, you put like few, uh, uh, like a few tons of weight and when you are traveling on a very hill area, right? And the force, uh, the vehicle, so vehicle is having hard time actually going and the load actually acting on the wheels and the engine's load is not matching. The wheels are having hard time actually keep on going. So in such case, or in such case, if the driver try to accelerate or to increase the engine RPM to go faster or to somehow push the vehicle, uh, it could it 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 actually could uh, it will actually um, how do I say this? it will actually damage the least uh, strength components in the drive line. It could be propeller shaft or axle shaft or something, right? But before that happens, right? By having a clutch before that happens, what clutch does is it started to slip, right? It started to slip as you can see over here and you as you know already. Clutch does not have the ability to actually, it's not bolted, right? It's actually not bolted to the flywheel or anything. It's in, it's sitting in between the flywheel and the pressure plate, but it's not bolted. So it's just, uh, it's capable. It's actually pre the pressure from the pressure plates only keeping it on the flywheel. So uh, when this sort of a difficult scenario comes in at that particular, at that sort of instant, the clutch plate started to actually slip, right? Clutch plate started to slip. By slipping the engine, it allowed the engine to actually accelerate 
but the uh, drive train components will not be actually having this power right it will not be getting any power so it won't getting additional torque than it could uh, already than it can handle so it won't be damaged so that purpose also actually uh, complete or actually uh, uh, actually done by the clutch assembly so this is a very important component so if we consider like few years not few years like at the beginning of the vehicle the clutch uh, was a very uh, important component it was a very important component it was the most popular or more only option available for transmission is manual so that was very important back then then the automatic transmission came but once the automatic transmission came this uh, particular clutch that sit sits between the engine and the gearbox or the transmission actually has taken out and it was uh, replaced by an uh, shock converter but later on later on means nowadays again the clutch is coming back into action especially because of the uh, because this uh, particular element this particular system does not need that much of a um, uh, that much of a um, so it's it's actually very economical to use this because it's not heavy oil uh, comparing to a usual uh you compare with the usual um, usual uh, sorry compared to the usual uh um, torque converter this uh, clutch assembly right clutch using a clutch assembly is a bit advantageous because it's not actually heavy it's not to use any uh, fluids to actually transfer so simple arrangement simple components maintenance is easy uh, very long lasting so there are a lot of advantages of using this so as a result of that uh, that uh, clutch plate is actually or the clutch assembly is come making a comeback with uh, automated manual transmissions which will we be which we will be discussing a bit later on so classification there is a classification for the clutch assembly so clutches there are different types of clutches different types of pressure plates so based on these uh, types uh, there are different uh, clutch plates are and uh, we can actually select which type of a clutch we actually need to use for a purpose so there are two main classifications right there are two main cl classifications so number one is type based on the type of pressure plate so there's a spring loaded pressure plate and there's the diaphragm pressure plate i'm sure you you have seen these two type of pressure plates and we have discussed it this regarding these two extensively during uh, your practical discussions so i'm pretty sure you can actually uh, go back and see it if we are not clear about that and uh, i may i might I remind you that uh, the videos are already available in your lms you can go and watch them if you forgot right in addition to that uh, there are two types of clutch plates also available so one is dry type clutch plate the other one is the wet type clutch plate so the difference between these two plates uh, clutch plates are actually the type of friction material used so if we come back to here the clutch plate actually so this is the clutch plate component so this is the clutch plate in the clutch plate you can see it. so this is actually cross section right this is a cross section so uh these two black sort of uh, two areas uh, uh, in both sides of this clutch plate is actually the friction material so this friction material uh, uh is uh, so friction material has a friction coefficient so using this friction coefficient and the pressure applied from the uh, pressure plate how we actually um, how actually we transfer the torque through the transmission right so uh in order for this to work there are certain conditions so one thing is this uh, material so if uh, there are the main difference as i told you the difference between these two clutch plates are is actually the wet type and the dry type uh the friction material so in the friction material for the wet type is somewhat different it actually have a higher friction coefficient even when it's actually in fluids right so wet type clutches i'm pretty sure you might have actually seen if you have seen a motorcycle clutch plate 
uh, wet type clutch plates are not that much common with uh, normal uh, road going or normal automobiles. It's very common in the motor uh, motorcycles as well as in like heavy vehicles. So dry type clutch is the most uh, used one for normal automobiles. The main reason is having a wet type clutch for a vehicle or a small or a smaller car or bus or something like that is not exactly necessary but in the motorcycles case it's uh, somewhat different because of the compact nature of that uh, engine uh, engine itself there's not much of a space available for as uh, there's uh, the uh, having separate space for uh, just to locate the or keep the clutch is a difficult task that's why it's actually using a wet type clutch so it's uh, simpler to make the construction and the design process simpler so but uh, there are uh, there are like heavy vehicles heavy vehicles actually use this wet type clutch one huge advantage of the wet type clutch is the cooling effect of the clutch right cooling of the clutch is actually done by the uh, sorry but that uh, actually uh, this uh, wet type clutch since it's actually filled with a fluid that fluid can actually absorb more heat so the um, so this uh, uh, so the uh, having uh, this sort of a clutch is important for uh, vehicles such as heavy vehicle so i put some uh, links if you wish to actually watch these things or if you'd like to see more detail uh, tear down of a clutch which um, unfortunately i can't sh show since i don't have one with me at the moment uh, so you can go ahead and watch this uh, video if you wish uh, yeah so so uh, the clutch is an important part or components as i told you earlier so the amount of torque actually the maximum torque a uh, uh, clutch plate can or clutch can transfer through actually depends on a few factors right so mainly it's actually depends on this particular area that means the frictional area right so this uh, wait one second mm. Mainly, it depends on this area, right? Mainly, it actually depends on this area. So, this section is the friction disk. So, this area is where the friction surfaces are. So, friction surface is the area that completely transfer all the torque from the engine up to the uh, gearbox input shaft right gearbox input shaft so here uh, the the maximum torque that can be transferred through a clutch plate is actually the clutch is actually depends on the friction coefficient of the friction surface that means the coefficient between this surface and the flywheel that means steel right and the area of the friction material on the clutch plate so that means this particular area that particular area, this uh, gray color area. Force applied by the pressure plate. How much of force is applied on it? Right? How much of force actually applied on it by the pressure plate? So based on these three, right? Based on these three, uh, the amount of force can be transferred through, or the amount of torque can be transferred through this uh, particular uh, particular um, for a particular uh, particular clutch plate actually increases right so uh, you can see you can see there are two equations i have given here if you look at the first one first one means this one uh, over here you can see the mu mu means the friction coefficient and r2 and r1 so r1 is the internal diameter internal radius right internal radius of this friction material and r2 is uh, outer radius of the uh, friction material right and the fa right fa actually 
uh, represents the nominal force pressing against the clutch plate. That means which uh, that's the pressure plate. How much of force is actually applied by the uh, pressure plate? That's what actually means by this F A. So over here you can see there are two equations, even though they both of them look the same. So the difference between these two are actually uh, uh, the difference between these two are actually so uh, the first one actually use for a clutch uh, clutch only for a single clutch. So in a single clutch, you have two surfaces, right? Two surfaces. So you have one surface contacting the uh, flywheel, the other surface is contacting the pressure plate, right? So you have two. But there are some clutch plates, something called a multi-blade clutch. If the clutch plate could not handle the amount of force put it through, then uh, we need to actually increase the surface area. In order to increase the surface area, uh, we use something called a multi-blade clutch, right? I will show you a multi-blade clutch later on. But in a multiplate clutch application, so multiplate clutches are used in the motorcycles also, right? Multiplate clutches are used in the motorcycles as well or heavy vehicles. Very rarely it's used in uh, normal like uh, passenger vehicles, except for like uh, like sports cars and everything they use, but uh, it's very rarely they use. Anyways, so in a, in an application like multi clutch, instead of we having these two, we use a symbol called Z. So what is it means is number of the friction surfaces, right? Number of the friction surfaces. So it's very easy to remember this. So if the number of friction surfaces is the twice the number of clutch placed used, right? So if it is uh, two clutch plates, that means four friction plates. And if it is only one clutch plate, that means there are two uh, friction uh, surfaces. So. That's what I actually mean by this Z symbol. So this, uh, the main equation is this, for any uh, clutch plate that's only having one, uh, one um, uh, clutch plate, you can actually uh, use the equation shown here. So this is, uh, this is something related to these clutches. So uh, this uh, clutch and um, clutch actually comes as a non-permanent, uh, device that used in mechanical engineering. So this is a very common device. There are different types of clutch, right? There are different types of clutch. There are centrifugal clutches, there's cone clutches. There are different types of clutches, but this is only one type of clutch. So whatever the clutch is, this same, uh, same principle is actually applied. So all of these clutch types actually use the same principle. The equation may be differ from clutch, clutch uh, type based on the clutch type, but the basic principle, basic principle mean the friction coefficient, uh, the area of the friction coefficient and the force applied. Those three um, main rules are applied for any type of clutch. Um, you can actually remember this equation. I will do one or two calculations, but I'm not. Let's see, it's not a big uh, difficult calculation or something. The, uh, another one more thing I would like to actually discuss is these springs. Right, these springs. I'm pretty sure you might have seen these springs in your ex school time also. The purpose of these springs is to uh, soft, to make it soft when the engine is actually engaging. So even though we sudden, we even though we actually disengage and engage at that time, clutch plate, right? At that time, the clutch plate suddenly grabs, right? Grabs the and uh, grabs the uh, fly, right? Grabs the flywheel from the outside. So when this outside is trying to turn, right? When outside is trying to turn, there's a swift, uh, it's create like a torsional force, right? It's create a torsional force, give me one, yeah. So it's create a torsional force, so like this smaller and small towards the center, right? So force creates sort of like that, this sort of force is created, right? So this torsional force has to be actually softened, right? It has to be softened. So that's why these springs are there. So these are actually damping springs, right? These are actually called as damping springs. 
so they dampen the contact with uh, the contacting okay so that's why these springs are there the number of springs and the st uh, strength of these springs actually differ from the application to application and there are some situations the, without any springs which i will show you uh, after this so this is the basic construction of a single plate and a multi-plate plate i'm sure you may be you are very much familiar with this so if you come here right if you come here you only have one clutch plate so this is your clutch plate right this is your clutch plate this is your clutch plate and it's actually sandwiched by one single pressure plate right one single pressure plate what happens in the multi plate clutch which actually have shown in here uh, is in so wait i'll change the color so we have i will try to Yeah, so we have one pressure plate, right? After that pressure plate, we again place another clutch plate. Right, another clutch plate. then we add another surface right so this is the same pressure plate we don't have different pressure plates we only have the single pressure plate right single pressure plate then we add the springs right then we add the spring so by do by doing this what we do is we sandwich the additional number of pressure plates so when we add additional number of pressure plates sorry we add additional number of clutch plates so when we add additional number of clutch plates in order to compensate for the surface area we need to add additional surfaces for pressure plate right so which increase the total surface area between the flywheel and the pressure plate itself so by doing so right by doing so we can actually increase the sorry by doing so we can actually increase the torque we can actually transmit so that's what actually shown here that is what actually shown here it's not that much clear in here but you 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 can actually see there are like clutch plates so these are the clutch plates over here and these are the uh flywheels right so these these are the pressure plates right these are the pressure plates in between so that's what's the difference between these two this is very important factor because yeah we usually nowadays talk about these uh dual clutch transmissions so the base of the dual clutch transmission is this right the base of the dual clutch transmission is this but there's a small twist to this uh, which we will be discussing later but if i give you like a small uh in uh, introduction so in the dual clutch transmission instead of having one next shaft that goes through both of these uh pressure plates it's actually sorry both of these clutch plates they actually have two different shafts right two shafts uh which goes through another shaft so one shaft is actually longer than the other one so one is connecting to one uh, shaft, the other one connecting to the other shaft. I'll, I'll show you, I'll show you next. Uh, but uh, the same principle is being used. Uh, one advantage is they can actually independently use each of the clutch plates separately. Okay, so uh, now we have three different clutch plates. Right, three different types of clutch plates. So, so whenever I say or whenever you remember something like a clutch plate, only thing you you the first thing you will come to mind is actually 
this one over here, the road car clutch, right? So this is the road car clutch assembly. So you have the pressure plate over there, wait. You have the road car uh, clutch plate over here, complete clutch plate, and you have, this one is the, uh, sorry, this one is the pressure plate and we have the friction plate over here, right? And this is your throwout bearing. So throwout bearing actually goes in the middle of these fingers. So once we come here, you can see it's a whole, uh, uh, the plate is actually completely uh, covered with friction material and you have the reverse springs and all the things that usually we talk about, right? That we usually talk about. But the other two applications, uh, the first one, if we start from the Formula One clutch, so this is a Formula One car, the race car, Formula One racing clutch. So this one is quite small. This one is quite smaller than the one used in this road car clutch. Uh, today we'll be discussing quite a few technologies that used in the uh, uh, Formula One because some of these things have come up to the uh, normal automobiles by now. So anyways, so this Formula One clutch is actually the size of our palm. That means around six inches, like 15 centimeters, that small. Even though the car is actually uh, transmitting around 1,800 to 1,000 uh, Newton meters of torque uh, for a normal vehicle, which we have uh, like 100, 150 Newton meters of torque, right? But the Formula One car is actually handling more torque, like right? quite a bit more torque, and uh, but still it uses a smaller clutch, right? Dimension so it's smaller, but it's actually lengthier. So it's actually a multi-plate clutch. By having a multi-plate clutch, right? By having this particular type of multi-plate clutch, it's actually uh, lets the uh, it's actually lets the sorry. One second. Uh, yeah. So um, by having this. Um, smaller clutch assembly it's actually reduces the weight and the size of it so the packaging everything inside of the engine bay of that small it's not exactly small but in a <laughs> race car makes it easier so for aerodynamics the car has to have like a small sizes and dimensions are there so that is there but to achieve that there are some uh, some uh, some things has to be changed one big example is this clutch plate. So this is your clutch plate. This is your average clutch plate. So the clutch plate is quite a bit different comparing to this one. So you don't have this center middle part on the center. Instead of having that, you just have a carbon ring. So this is mostly asbestos material, but this is completely made out of carbon, which is really expensive, but having very high, uh, friction serve high uh, friction coefficient which allow the uh, gears not to slip at all so these are actually designed to do only one specific function so they can actually do that purpose well but uh, comparing to a normal road car which has to have like very wide range of uh, uh, things has to be done wide range means it has to should be able to drive at slow speed high speeds uh, traffic and every condition so all of these things actually has to be uh, has to be considered. So the some compromises had to be made in designing this sort of thing. That's why the clutch so uh, of a normal vehicle is like this. But the same clutch, same clutch also comes in the one shown below. So this is actually known as a racing clutch. So uh, you might see that the pressure plate is uh, not much of a difference between the pressure plate but the clutch plate is quite a bit different clutch plate is quite a bit different even though it's actually designed to transfer more torque the surface area is actually small surface area is small you might be thinking so how this is going to work when you have less surface area so in this case the purpose of these sort of surf, uh, these sort of clutch arrangement is to actually reduce the weight so by removing, uh, like, let's say this is one third of the weight, one third, uh, yeah, around one third of the surface area, the friction area was removed. But uh, uh, 
uh, even though it's actually reduced the surface area, it can be gained again by changing the material used in these surface areas, right? These surface areas, if we have higher friction coefficient material, then again, the same purpose can be achieved. Same purpose can be achieved. But there are some uh, disadvantages also. So by having these sort of flywheel, it's actually reduced the weight. Sorry, this type of a flash plate, it's actually reduces the weight. When you reduce the weight, that actually going to affect your vehicle. How it's going to affect your vehicle is one advantage of this sort of arrangement is the vehicle, the engine can actually increase its RPM faster, right? Faster. So the engine actually responds faster. But at the same time, when the engine is actually idling, that means at low RPMs, uh, the engine started to get rough. The reason is you reduce the part of weight from the flywheel, right? So this whole component is actually belongs to flywheel. Everything here is actually belongs to flywheel. So by having these sort of arrangements, it actually reduces the drivability. So these sort of clutches are not that easy to drive. And the other part is these uh, pressure blades. These pressure blades, the amount of force that's actually developed by these sort of pressure blades is higher than a normal clutch, right? Normal clutch. In order to achieve that, right? To achieve that, these uh, fingers, these diaphragm fingers have to have a higher tension, right? Higher tension. So when you have higher tension, but uh, ultimately, you need to put more effort in order to actually disengage the clutch. So that's not ideal for everyday use. That's not ideal because it's difficult for you to actually drive the car in slow condition where you actually have to press uh, depress the clutch up to some extent, right? So uh, still you can see these springs are there, the springs, the pressure or the dampening springs are still there. But if you look at here, there's no but damping still, uh, damping springs are available. So this is, as I told you earlier, it's designed and developed to do a certain function. So it does not care about having uh, springs or anything like that, or the driver comfort or anything. It's just made to go fast, right? So having a high RPM is important for this uh, particular engine. So smaller lightweight is very important for these applications, but uh, by having this, the, the way the clutch actually grabs, or the cow clutch is actually being engaged is very rough. It's going to be very rough, difficult to get uh, to train, but in the racing applications, so the drivers have been trained to do so, that's not a big deal. So that's what the main difference between the main few differences between a normal clutch and a uh, purpose built race application sort of clutch arrangement. So uh, which means is actually these uh, sort of clutch plates are very aggressive. Aggressive means they uh, engage very fast and disengage very fast. At the same time, they are very heavy. Heavy means how much of load you have to actually put in order to or you have you have to put you have to push harder to actually uh, disengage the clutch. So that's why the vehicle's clutch plate is somewhat like this, and a normal vehicle clutch plate is somewhat like this. And the race car sort of arrangement, you know, the sports or racing application cuts are somewhat different, right? And the other thing is, since they are using different advanced uh, materials which are not being used in the other normal automotive applications, these are quite expensive, right? These are quite expensive. In this case, they have to increase, for example, this um, the race clutch case, they have to increase the frictional coefficient of these two, three, uh, these material as well as to increase the pressure or applied by the pressure plate, right? So that's going to cost a lot. Uh, there are, the, if you come back to these normal day-to-day -day vehicle problems, usually there are few clutch issues uh, uh, comes with. The clutch issues are very easy to find out and easy to fix actually because it's very uh, consent or come find components and uh, when it's actually not performing well you can actually feel it so first one is the friction material wear which is the most common one so in such case you just have to actually uh, replace the clutch plate and very easy to actually identify if you remove the whole clutch assembly 
if uh, you can actually touch or if you can if you can't feel the indentation in the river so that means uh, sorry sorry over here so if you look at here there's like a small sort of hole for the rivers right uh, if you can't so this is like a uh, general rule if you can't actually see a hole if you can directly touch without any indentation of uh, without any indentation if you can touch the uh, uh, if you can touch these uh, uh, rivets that means the clutch plate is worn out before i go ahead i just have one more question do you, anyone know why there are grooves here these grooves are available here also grooves are there this one also groups are there. Why there are groups here? Do anyone know the answer for that? Elongation. Elongation purpose. Hmm? Elongation purpose. So I didn't hear what? Can you repeat? Elongation purpose when the plate when heated heat up. Alignment. Elongation. Ventilation. Sorry, sorry. Elongation. Elongation. Yeah. Oh no no no. Elongation means uh, I, I expansion. You you mean expansion, right? Yes, sir. Oh no, no, that's it's not for like that. So because you have to understand, there's no actual gap between these. It's just a groove, right? This it's just a groove. Underneath this, still the steel is just a normal round. So when this is actually expanding, it's not expanding that way. So for uh, these sort of applications, so for round thing like this, right? Expansion is actually this way, right? Radial expansion. It's actually a radial expansion for round versions, round steel sort of things. So expansion is not the case here, right? The reason is actually, so when the clutch is actually operating, there's dust is created. So this material is started to wear out. So that worn out material should not be staying in these surfaces. It has to be removed so that, uh, this how this actually design is so that material particles which these material particles that are worn out particles will actually fall into these grooves and when the clutch is spinning right when the clutch is spinning they actually travel through this from the centrifugal force they are actually uh, taken out from the clutch plate so you can actually see this whenever you complete the disassemble the engine the all, uh, sorry, not the engine. <laughs> Once you remove the transmission out of the vehicle, you should be able to see this inside of the bell housing. It's actually black, right? This dust of these material, friction material dust is actually uh, covering the whole area. So that actually the that uh, that phenomenon it's actually generated by these grooves. These grooves actually remove that. That's the main reason for having this. Uh, you, you can actually clear this in some clutch plates like wet clutch places it's not necessary because the fluid is actually removed uh yeah clutch issues uh worn out pressure plate yes when the pressure plate is worn out it's not actually uh delivering enough pressure so worn out pressure plate uh, difficult to identify uh, but uh, if you are very uh, familiar with the gearbox it's very simple to understand so clutch sticking means the clutch uh, started to fuse with the pressure plate and, uh, and the flywheel so what actually happens is if the vehicle stop for a very long time for cold and high temperature situation if the cycle the material since it has been long time together it may end up fusing together a right? defective clutch cylinder that means the this uh, cylinders over here so this one and this one over here so master cylinder and the second cylinder air bubbles in the hydraulic system 
so that happens very often so if we uh, like a brace application sort of thing if the clutch is being used again and again and again the fluid started to actually boil right fluid started to boil that cause air to come inside and if it is pro uh, not properly um, air bubbles if the air bubbles were not properly taken out it could have uh, caused the clutch to not operate well then uh, improper clutch paddle adjustment so clutch paddle actually has a small play to it right there's a small play until it actually engage so this depends from vehicle to vehicle uh, but uh, usually it's around 10 to, to 10 to 30 millimeters of travel is there right 10 to 30 millimeters travel is there so uh, free travel this is only a free travel so it's not actually traveling the pressure the pressure is not applied but the free travel is there. So these, if this is not properly adjusted, whenever you press the clutch, right? Even if you apply a small force, that force actually transfer through whole system and the pressure uh, that uh, um, the pressure the pressure plate will not be working properly. So the clutch plate start to actually slip, right? Well, that cause for premature warning of the uh, wearing out of the clutch plate. Uh, throughout bearing failure, so this bearing is a one component that will wear very fast because especially it's spinning as soon as, as fast as the uh, engine itself, but unfortunately, and uh, there's no lubrication comes up to you. There are no lubrication uh, provided to these throughout bearing. So as a result of that, they actually tend to go out of like uh, 50, 60,000 uh kilometers so the, this is actually one of the preventive maintenance we do for vehicle so when we come to maintenance of a vehicle there are two types of maintenance so so something called uh running problems right so <clears throat> we have running issues and in addition to that we have something called a uh, preventive maintenance so preventive maintenance means there are a set of maintenance you need to do in order to re prevent any further any uh, damages later on. The one good example is this oil change. Oil changing is a preventive maintenance. So every this after this much of time, you have to change the oil. That's a preventive maintenance. Uh, in some cases, you can actually run more than that. But it's a uh, for to in order to prevent any further damages to the engine, you need to change the engine oil. Uh, there are so many uh, uh, few small small things like that. One is that uh, the tire rotation. You have to change the tire rotation after this much of time, and you have to change the timing chain or not timing chain timing belt after this much of mileage. And there are in some vehicles the with the chain they have timing uh, chain guides has to be replaced after this much of time. And throughout bearing, uh, what is uh, yeah, one um, um, is uh, I told you I, we talked about this coil on plug system. So in the coil on plug uh, ignition system, the coil uh, coil pack, the whole coil pack. If it is four coil packs, the whole four coil packs has to be replaced. Like seventy five thousand to hundred thousand kilometers. After like that, you have to replace it. That's because of the heat cycles. It's actually uh, going through. It cannot bear more than that so they, these sort of small uh small changes are the small uh, things actually uh give out a big output so these are actually important these small things are very important for a vehicle to be properly maintained so that's one of the reasons the uh, for these uh, when you take a vehicle to maintenance in a so uh, yeah i'll talk about this one second so you know that uh, the, so we have uh, what do say, a dealer or agent. So uh, there are agencies and we have normal vehicle many uh, shops, right? So you know that the agencies they charge more than a normal vehicle, normal place to actually do a repair. The reason is actually there are uh, in when they are uh, doing a service or maintenance by the agent, they are actually bound. Right, they actually bound with the manufacturer to do all of these maintenance. They're supposed to do the maintenance, they have to check everything and give a full report to the driver itself. Right. So it does not matter how much is the code, they have to do. So for that, they actually have to 
charge a little bit higher and they have to use the proper uh, given or sometimes there are proper materials or proper um, they, are, they have given like proper brand names in some cases so they have to use those brand names so once it comes to that the expense is very high in addition to that the name also uh, yeah, expect a little bit high but but that's a bound or that, that's a legal thing they have to do right in order to be the agent and in order to maintain the vehicle brand's reputation though the manufacturer's reputation though uh, the agent in sri lanka actually have to do it in any country this is the same every country if you take it to the manufacturer's so agent it's actually going to cost more right but they will do it properly right they will do it properly for example uh, for this particular application so let's say that the, the uh, we have a throwout bearing problem so we replace the throwout bearing and uh, then we have to actually assemble everything together so one place you have to assemble is the transmission right transmission with the engine itself so when you are assembling the transmission and everything so there's a torque value right there's a torque value how much tight every component has to be so all of these things all of these details are available for the uh, dealer right anyone else no you have to purchase it so these details are not available everywhere you actually have to uh, this uh, maintenance uh, there's maintenance schedules maintenance schedules you have workshop manuals which i actually have a workshop manual university also i prepare kept few of my workshop manuals in to come i can show it but uh, after end of this i will show you a workshop manual right so uh, these uh, manuals actually they have every detail so this actually going to cost more because to uh, obtain all of these things and some cases for some manufacturers like bmw or audi or something like that you need to have special tools to do a proper maintenance so these things are not cheap so they have to have it so because of that it's expensive so one main reason is they are doing the preventive maintenance this manufacturer the dealers have to do the preventive maintenance so it actually going to cost a lot right uh that's given but uh, that's one of the reasons these uh, dealer maintenance vehicles have uh, more uh, value when they are selling they have more value because people like to buy them but afterwards they are not going to repair it the same way but people like to buy them anyway uh, we'll move to the next plot okay so next we move to the automated manual transmission as i promised so automated manual transmission is a very old technology right as for <laughs> as for everything we discuss whatever you see in vehicles are not started like we did not started like very recently even though it became very popular very recently this was not a very new thing right it's not a very new thing it started um in 1989 88 or something like that that's just i think you that six just even before i born right these things start so that's around 30 32 33 32 something years old at right? this technology so this technology actually came to be with formula 1 technology so most of these a uh, lot of things are there the clutch designs the dual clutch systems and everything actually came from formula 1 so this actually also came from uh, formula 1 car so the particular car is actually shown here this is the first car i can remember the name of this this is some ferrari 89 or something <laughs> so this car is actually a ferrari so ferrari brand actually started doing this first and they are the first uh, as per my knowledge they are the first people to actually put this into a actual vehicle as well so anyways um this uh, automated manual transmission means is just a manual transmission was actually turned into automated system so still you have the still you have all the components you have the gear changers right you still have the usual gearbox as a manual gearbox but the clutch 
and the gear changing forks were controlled by a computer system right and the changing of gears and everything is done by electrically or hydraulic right so hydraulic actuators or electric actuators are used to change the gears in this particular application so the reason for this system to actually design and develop main there are two main reasons for development of this the, i have to actually explain this the today's uh, amt technology and those days amt technology were very different right so as per my knowledge the first uh, like road vehicle came in like early 2000s early 2000s like 2000 or 98 99 or something like that right back then this technology is so bad this automated manual transmissions was so bad um, a very good example is as for my knowledge the first one to use this technology is formula uh, sorry ferrari f360 right f360 i may be wrong you can actually check about this but anyways so the the problem with this uh, system is uh, wait the, before that so how this actually came about this so in a formula 1 race the car actually creates so gear changing is a very big task right gear changing is a very big task when you change the gears it has to be precise right it has to be fast but uh, also the vehicle so this car has to have a very small cross sectional area to reduce the aerodynamic drag created by the vehicle so to do that the vehicle actually has to have a narrow footprint so these cars were getting narrowed the area available for the driver inside the vehicle is small right or um, available inside the vehicle is small so as a result of that they actually have to have a, so having a gear changer means the h pattern gear change or something it's actually big task changing the gear means you have to actually take your hand out of the steering wheel and change the gear so that actually take a lot of effort and it take time and it needs space right so to fix all of these things automated manual transmission was used so the driver cabin or the this cockpit this section is actually called as the cockpit is actually narrower now the driver have the paddles so they have these paddles steering wheel actually have paddles right so this is how the paddles actually came to be also so these paddles can actually change the uh, can uh, paddles actually change the gears right paddles actually change the gear so up one paddle is upwards and other paddle is changing the down so this is actually sequential gearbox they can't change from 1 to 4 they have to have go from 1 2 3 4 right you can't change from 1 to 4 directly you always have to go 1 2 3 4 or you have to press four times the uh, change up to four anyways so uh, this uh, so that's how it actually developed right so the first few races the car was not working properly this and that big problem reliability issues this is the first time they are manufacturing or designing this it takes some time so later on like 1989 or something i can't remember exactly years these things right uh, so uh, uh, but uh, somehow when the system started to work very well right when they managed to fix all these bugs and everything Uh, the car was able to actually pull through and go faster than others especially thanks to transmission because it can change gears faster so that small change small gap so assume how many times you are changing the gear so that let's say you are changing 100 times gears for the whole race right let's say you save like one second that's 100 seconds right that's one minute over the others for racing it's like one year so that's a important part for this car so it became very popular but still one problem was there this particular gearbox type was actually designed for formula 1 cars so formula 1 cars are not going fast so, so not going slow they don't have traffic issues they go faster on a race track right so they were not that much reliable and easy to use for a normal vehicle the slowest these cars will go is in the pits before they change the tires and eh, that's around 60 km per hour right that's not slow in a normal public road right so public road it's actually slow right public road slow means like 30 40 so this type of transmission were not that good in a normal uh, gear vehicle right and the other problem is the gear changing 
right gear changing is done by a computer right computer so it has to be precisely do it doing the whole changing gear changing and everything has to be done very precisely right so it's a big task right big task so there was a lot of issues in the previous it's like early 2000s the, even though vehicles were with them when they are going faster these gear systems were working very well right they were working very well but when they were going slowly the gear changing was very difficult the route the car seems to be very clunky sort of things and they were braking very fast um the one two two of the earliest vehicles to have these sort of gears is the as i told you ferrari 360 and the lamborghini uh yeah lamborghini marshall and uh, when you have like one single clutch plate these seems to be impossible to drive right impossible to drive so later on this actually the problems or the kings were little by little fixed and uh, these became a very popular option for normal uh, vehicles there are few things to be uh, for reusing these things one of these thing is the part as a part of the drive by wire technology so nowadays vehicles are almost like drive by wire drive by wire means there are no physical connection between the vehicle and the driver vehicle and the driver so even though steering wheel and everything is actually electronically controlled so except for the brake pedal everything else is almost electronically only thing available is steering still have the shaft because you need to have it in order to steer when the vehicle turn off the brake also the same reason and for safety uh, gear changing the accelerator pedal nothing is or now connected so all are done by electronically so even though you press the accelerator pedal expecting a cable to move there are no cables moving now so you are uh, it's just che checking how much of all the the uh, throttle positioning sensor actually has been replaced to the throttle uh, paddle or your accelerator paddle and the engine throttle valve is actually controlled by a motor itself so part of that is this so this all this drive by wire technology incorporating is actually the grand plan of making the vehicles um, autonomous so in order to make them autonomous everything has to be electronically controlled so this also a part of that one main advantage of this sort of uh, gearbox is manufacturer do not actually have to manufacture two gearboxes for the same car right same car that means there are two vehicles with uh, the same car let's say toyota corolla corolla comes with the manual transmission as well as auto transmission so when they are coming with manual and auto transmissions if you had to build two transmissions right if you had to build two transmission that's going to add like 50 60 times 50 60 millions or something because for a manufacturer they can't just build something they have to build design it build it test it fix everything all the bugs again comes back design build then again testing and then only they can go for production right so by having this arrangement they can only build one gearbox right and add these automated component into that particular transmission right that particular transmission make it a automatic drive right automatic vehicle so that was a big uh, important part for a vehicle so that's one main reasons to actually become very popular option so this is a very popular and uh, uh, and uh, even though uh, even though my most uh, companies have different names for these so one have amt transmission the other is called auto automatic shift uh, gears and uh, these names were just trade names they are just using their own trade names but the technology and the function or the basic function of the gears and everything is the same so i have put few names one is amt automated manual transmission do dct dual clutch transmission e gear electronic gear dsg which i can't read that's in german right uh, so these are the two three times amt is uh, the most common one dct is used by this uh, honda e gear is actually used by lamborghini uh, company dsg is actually used by um this volkswagen so even though these no, uh, EGA is, yeah, this is used by Volkswagen.
so there are a few in uh, one video i would like you all to see it uh, it will be very useful if you see it because you can see all of these things that i explained in one video so uh yeah so this picture shows a normal automated manual transmission so one thing you have to be very uh conscious about this one here so this is a normal transmission as you can see here. and there's a one additional component fixed into it so this is the automated manual transmission component right so this is what it actually does so it's directly bolted into the normal transmission itself right so then it takes over the clutch pedal and and the gear shifting mechanism right so uh, it takes all things thing to itself so uh, this particular one is actually hydraulically actuated version so you have to put hydraulic fluid into here so there's a small reservoir here and then you have a electric motor in over here so this electric motor generate the uh, pressure necessary for the transmission uh, change of the transmission so then actuators so these are the actuators fixed here so these are the actuators so these are actuators and the brain of the whole system is over here right so the computer that control half of the computer that control here the other half is in the uh, engine or uh, the vehicle <coughs> uh, sorry uh, power train transmission or power train control module right so power train control module like think i already mentioned this power train control module consists of the transmission control engine control and chassis control right so those three component computers once you combine them all into one that's power train control module so that control whole vehicle so it makes it easier to uh, communicate with each other so in order to change the gears properly or smoothly uh, the transmission has to communicate with the engine so for example you have to actually remove the accelerator before you change the uh, before you actually change the gear you need to actually reduce the engine rpms or increase the engine rpms when you are actually engaging again so these sort of communication has to be done so this actually part this part is done inside the powertrain control modules and it sends a signal to this uh, particular component here okay now change from this to this right so that's what actually happens here right let me give you a bit more explanation into this right so uh if i draw sorry about it. it's not being very clear but all of these actually comes under the powertrain control module right all of these actually comes under the power train control module so even though transmission control unit is a separate components it's also needs right it's also needs some inputs one is ignition where the brake accelerator pedal brake whether you are applying brakes so if you are applying the brakes right then the engine a vehicle started slow down when vehicle is slowing down the gears has to be changed again right again change back to the lower gear right so if you are going at four or fourth gear at 60 km per hour if you press the brake then vehicle is slowing down to 40 means uh, transmission now the transmission control module is now okay now i have to change from this to that that means uh, fourth to third gear because vehicle is slowing down whenever he is uh, trying to accelerate again if you are not in the correct trans correct gear vehicle will not actually properly it will not be able to actually accelerate instead of it will actually start to jerk right so to fix these sort of things you need the ignition accelerator pod, uh, position uh, program selector program selector means whether you need a harsh change so this nowadays you have seen like a sports uh, comfortable these sort of things are coming sports means sudden very fast gear changing soft means very simple soft means very lazy gear change in sort of application so these things functions display what sort of varying changes has been there diagnostic additional programs this is uh, related to something else something else means related to this uh, chassis control brakes abs everything right so transmission rpm whether the gears can be changed at transmission whether it's going to uh, uh, damage transmission itself then it's actually talk to the engine management unit it controls the engine transmission controls the transmission itself right 
So transmission controls two actuators. One is this uh, clutch actuator. The other one is this uh, transmission changing actuator, right? Gear changing actuator. So these two actuators are controlled by him, this unit over here, right? This is a very simple, the idea is actually simple, but the, <laughs> making it work is very difficult, right? Making it work is very difficult. One main thing is the, this is very software based compared to the pre, everything else. This is very much software based. So this particular application, particular type of transmission is used in the uh, Honda vessel, the 2013-2014 Honda vessels had a problem with the transmission overheating this and that. So that problem was actually able to fix. That was something to do with the software control. There was a small bug in the software and there's a, some difficult um, system error. So that was uh, most of the, uh, it was actually fixed. It was fixed by the company itself. The vehicles were recalled and uh, done a software upgrade. Software upgrade was done and just send them back to fix this. So having this sort of autonomy or oh, this sort of arrangement is very easy for a manufacturer because software manufacturing is cheaper. Software updating is cheaper. Updating the hardware part, that means these transmission changes, these actuators, that part is very expensive, right? That part is very expensive and uh, time consuming. So uh, this sort of arrangement is very much preferred by almost all the manufacturers nowadays. We'll be talking about this vessel problem a bit more as well. Uh, now, <laughs> yeah, so uh, one of the main issues with this uh, transmission is the number of clutches. So the clutch arrangement is um, difficult, but there are some advantages also. So one main advantage is this clutch actuator, right? This clutch actuator, you can have more than one clutch and it can actually allow, you can actually allow it to actuate two different clutch. Earlier, we only had one paddle. But uh, now, instead of having one paddle, we can actually use the electronic signal to change between gears using one clutch, the, the between clutches. So that's actually considered as the dual clutch transmission, which is available in the Honda vessel and almost all the Honda vehicles, Honda automated, um, Honda vessel and Honda GP5, right? Those are actually hydraulically operated clutch and um, Clutch, I can't remember. Yeah. Clutch and gear transmission is done by hydraulic actuators, right? Hydraulic actuators. So dual clutch transmission, right? Dual clutch transmission means uh, dual clutch transmission. It's a very simple ex system. The idea is actually simple. Working is somewhat different. So you have two different clutch packs, right? Two different clutches, right? Two different clutch, but each clutch is actually only operating a set of gears. So here, as you can see over here, there are two clutches here. Let me change the color to like uh, right. So you can see there's like a green color set, right? There's a green color clutch pack and a red color clutch, right? So green color clutch is only uh, responsible for two and four gears, that means odd number gears, right? Sorry, even number gears. And red color clutch is only uh, responsible for changing between uh, even number, sorry, odd number gears. So in here you have one, two, four, one, two, three, four, five, five gears are there. So the odd number gears transmission shaft right input shaft actually goes through the outer transmission shaft so there are two input shafts here two input shaft one input shaft is actually goes through another one is the green color one is connected to one shaft and the red color one is connected to the another shaft okay so this allow the gears to actually change interchange between without right without actually changing the gear right without actually changing the gear so let me give you a very simple explanation right so assume that you need to change from one to two 
so you are now in the first gear now first gear engage means the outer clutch in this clutch the red clutch right clutch 2 clutch 2 is engage with the gear uh, engage with the engine right engage with the engine the power from the torque from the engine actually transmit through here and comes this way up to the first gear wheel so these are the first gear wheels then it's actually traveled through this line and over here but when you are actually changing the gear from first to second uh, now when you are traveling at first gear the vehicle knows now your next movement is to change it to second gear right now you know it knows that you're going to change it to second gear so what it actually does is right what it actually does is uh, before you select the gear before you change the gear the clutch is now disengaged so there's no power or the door coming through this green color shaft right there's no power coming through this green color shaft so this particular part is not getting any torque so it, they, it's not rotating right but the gear box right gear box actuators the gear transmission actuators is still actually uh, assembled it's it's actually it still uh, engages the second gear that means it's already selected the second gear now it's engaged but there's no power transmission it's, there's no power transmission between these two why there's no power transmission because the clutch is disengaged so when you ask to change from second to third what it actually does is instead of changing between the gears moving the uh, string mesh unit what it actually does is it's disengage the clutch red color clutch and engage the green color clutch right so now you are in the second gear because already the gear is selected right as soon as this completed the gearbox or the transmission control unit ask the the actuator to change the from now first gear is assembled change the uh, string mesh unit from first to third now it's ready to change back to third gear it's already ready to change it to third gear right so again when you are changing the clutch it's already connected so instead of change the gear you can directly engage and this can engage the clutch right this engage the clutch so this make is very easy right this make it very easy okay so that's how it actually started to work that's how it actually works but uh, that's not the exact case there's a small change because uh, the gear is not actually selected so when while the clutch is uh, engaged in the gear is selecting uh, either first or third right that's the only change because in a road application we don't know whether we are going from first to second or first to so if you are in third gear we don't know whether we are going from third to uh, fourth or fourth uh, third to second it may be either one so uh, that because of that while clutch is actually uh, engaging only the gears also be engaging in this uh, in the road application but in a, um, but when you are traveling at a fast or like a racing application the gear is already uh, uh, engaged clutch only changes right so they, there are two scenarios this system can work so by doing that uh, gear is already selected the time it's needed to change the gears between the gears is very low right very low so it can actually travel fast right travel fast um yeah so the the problem with this uh, uh the, some gear boxes ended up having like a they can't even move what actually happens is the gears these uh, there are two uh these vessels vessels had some issues so uh in 2013 12 or something uh 12 or 13 i'm not exactly sure the year so these vessels back in the day had an issue with these gearboxes so what actually had their issue was the software glitch created these two uh, there are two gears engaged and the vehicle 
the clutch is also engaged so when the vehicle is trying to move it's actually trying to rotate in two different directions so it can't move so vehicle won't move right that's what actually happened to those vehicles back then uh, uh not recently it was like long time ago in the first few years that uh, ended up uh, creating like a big issue here though anyway so i'm sure you might have gotten some idea how this system works uh yeah the other thing is uh, for the uh, hybrid system of dual clutch vehicles though they have the motor uh, so motor is fixed into this shaft right second shaft so it's only goes through a set of gears it's not going through all the gears only set of gears right set of gears it will actually work so it only work with the first and second sort of thing it's not actually uh, working at all times it's not necessary for this gear to work at all times okay we'll move to the next topic okay now we're going to discuss where is uh shortly about the drive line so uh drive line is how to transmit the power from the transmission up to the axle so based on how we transmit we have front engine front wheel drive rear engine rear wheel drive front engine rear wheel drive and front engine all wheel drive and four wheel drive different types of transmission systems or drive lines are there so whatever the drive line is there's only using a few dozen or very few components there's not much of a difference between them so we'll discuss about them little by little so uh, first thing is drive shaft or the propeller shaft so propeller shaft mostly used in vehicles when they uh, when they actually have this uh, uh, front engine rear wheel drive applications right propeller shaft and axle shaft are two different things one thing you have to remember propeller shaft or axle shaft or half shaft we also call them half shafts half shaft for the cv joints they use half shaft it's not a propeller shaft so the difference between these two is uh, propeller shaft inside is actually hollow so it's actually empty right but in the um, prop uh, axle shaft it's actually a thin solid shaft right thin solid shaft uh, it has to be like that one main reason is to uh, for that is uh, it's actually transmit bit of higher torque but there are other applications these use this particular type as well so propeller shaft or drive shaft usually transmit the power from the uh transmission output shaft from the transmission up to the axle itself so it's comprised with few components so you have you can see over here the body so you have the yoke so this is called as the universal joints right universal joint this is a very important component so this allow the drive shaft to actually twist it so allows the drive shaft to actually so the suspension can actually not twist actually it allows the suspension to move up and down right up and down even though the transmission is in the same place and to compensate for this movement while this movement is actually happening it's actually uh, the in order to keep the trans this uh, uh, this one properly sorry in order for it to well uh, and since this is actually connected over here the length of this propeller shaft actually also have to be changed or increase and decrease based on the uh, suspension location to do that it actually have to have a slip joint so this is the slip joint over here it's a slip joint and power transmit through the yoke or sorry this is the universal joint there are two universal joints used by universal joints it's transmit the power you in whatever the uh, position the axle is actually so when we come to this uh, unisil joint it's very uh, unisil joint also called as a hooks joint right it's also called as hooks joint so hooks joints or unisil joints actually very simple application you have one yoke yoke means this y part right this part is actually called as yoke and in between you have like a cross so this cross is actually known as the um, 
This cross is actually called as the spider, right? That's actually called as the spider. So spider actually consists with four bearings on each end, right? Four bearings on each end. So these bearings allow the uh, prop shaft to move, right? Prop shaft to move without any issues, right? And now without any issues. This system is very good, but there are some issues to this. So one thing is uh, in order for this to work properly. So uh, if this is, so angle wise, the same angle has to actually turn from both sides. That means over here and here. I don't know whether you get this. So wait, wait. This is your gearbox and engine. This is your axle, right? And the angles, the operating angles, right? Operating angles, this angle, right? Both of these actually have to have the same angle. Both of these need to have the same angle. Otherwise, this won't work properly. So that's why it's actually more use two joints rather than using one joint. By using two joints, it's always having the same uh, angle at all times. It's always try to keep the same angle at all times, right? So that's one, one disadvantage of the system. And the other thing is since this whole shaft is to be moved, it's need with more room to actually operate. So uh, the, I think you can remember when we were talking about this uh, transaction, I told instead of you in the transaction, when uh, there's front, engine rear wheel drive and the uh, application there are sometimes the gearbox is completely moved to the back so that movement that gearbox movement was done to uh, for get the weight balance so in such cases this sort of application is not used right they, that particular one is not actually a drive shaft or a prop shaft that's actually called as a torque tube Right, it's actually called as a torque tube. The difference between the torque tube and the, um, uh, the, this prop shaft is prop shaft is actually not a uh, components that is rigid. It's not a structural component. It's not a structural component. But in the torque tube, it's actually a st uh, structural component. So what it actually provides a uh, torsional rigidity to the body itself, right? It's provide the torsional rigidity. That's two different components. So next we move to the axle shaft. So axle shaft means like two, uh, there are two different types of axle shafts are there. Uh, this is actually, I used uh, one axle shaft that's used in the, so normal axle shaft means the axle similar to this. This is actually known as a, uh, we call as full float uh, type suspension system. But uh, if we move to the uh, normal independent front wheel drive sort of application, the axle shaft, or oh, we call them as half shafts, they are somewhat different, right? Somewhat different. So the difference between this and that is uh, in this particular application, especially these front wheel drive applications, these two shafts lengths are not equal. Right, lengths are not equal. So in these also, you can actually use the universal joints, but mostly you might have seen this using a CV joints. I'll come to that point next. But uh, I need to discuss something before that to say in the steering also, I'll be discussing that. So what actually happens here is you can see since how this engine and everything is arranged, right? Uh, one problem arises, these lengths are not equal, right? When these lengths are not equal, the torsion developed in these, right? Torsional force because of the because of the forces acting on them is actually different. So, lower the length if the length is when the length increases, the torsional force actually increases. So the torque actually uh, torsion is increasing. So the torsional uh, deformation, yes, torsional deformation. The word is torsional deformation. So torsional deformation is higher on this side than 
uh, or this side. So since it is a shorter shot, so this create an issue. The issue comes as an uh, torque steer, right? So front wheel, most of the front wheel vehicles actually cause something called a torque steer. Since two different uh, lengths and because of the length, the torque steer makes it difficult. Two different torque outputs come from these two wheels. So as a result of vehicle, even though steering angle and how we move, uh, what we expect to vehicles to move and the where the vehicle is actually traveling is somewhat different. That's actually called as torque steer. Right. There's a small, simple way to fix that. That's the, this is the fix actually shown here. So even though the length of the shafts are same, there's another additional shaft in the middle, right? There's an additional shaft in the middle that reduces this. It won't fix it, but it will reduce because the torsional, uh, torsional forces is actually reducing this case so that's one simple explanation it's a simple solution but it's not going to fix everything right so this is actually something happening in this what you call these hot hatches so anyways uh, so this is actually the normal axle shaft arrangement but uh, there are few other axle shafts also which we need to discuss so these axles comes in all different sizes and shapes right sizes and shapes so when there's no power transmitted through them, right? If there's no power transmitters through these axles, they are actually called as dead axles, right? That's a dead axle. If there's power transmitted through them, it's actually called as a live axle, right? So this is a live axle. So you can see there's a, pro, uh, the, what do you call it? Differential housing and the axle housings are there. So this is actually known as a, uh, live axle and the bottom one is actually dead axle because no power is actually transmitted through them. The only thing axle does is bear the weight of the vehicle. That's all it actually doing, right? And the purpose of these uh, prop shafts and the axle shafts are differing from vehicle to vehicle, right? That actually has something to do with the suspension also, right? Suspension also. Now, uh, this uh, independent suspension, suspension and dependent suspension, there are two different types of suspensions are there. So this is the independent suspension type. So in the independent suspension side, the, deep, uh, the dead axle is shown here and this one over here. So you can see the differential is as usual. So this is similar to the front wheel application. Still the engine power is transmitted up to the differential through the prop shaft. Right, through the prop shaft, it still have the usual U joints and everything, but the prop differential is not moving with the axle itself. Right, it's not moving anywhere. It's actually fixed to the engine vehicle chassis itself. Only two wheels, only two wheels are moving. So the suspension components only move up and down. So this sort of arrangement is also available. So in these type of arrangements, it uses a half shaft, half shafts with CVs or universal joints, right? So this is uh, very common now, these front engine rear wheel drive vehicles actually use this. Earlier it actually used to have a similar arrangement to this with the bit simpler suspension arrangement, but uh, because of the advantages of having this sort of arrangement, there are two advantages. One is less uh, travel of the prop shaft, so less space has to be given to the prop shaft. And the main advantage is because the independent suspension of the car vehicle will be more comfortable. So this arrangement is now more popular, right? So in these uh, shafts or axle shaft and prop shaft and everything, there are two types of joints used. Remember, there are a lot of types of joints available, but the main two types of joints are the universal joints and the constant velocity joints, also known as CV joints, right? Uh, you might have seen most of the vehicles nowadays are using CV joints as much as possible. The reasons, there are a few reasons. Uh, if you can look at the graph shown on the middle, right? So this, except for this yellow color one, right? Yellow color line, everything else is actually showing the operation angle, right? This beta angle of the joints. 
right of the universal joint right when the universal joint is operating at this particular angle how much or oh, what is the difference angular velocity difference angular velocity difference so that is shown here so when the angle actually increases the difference between these two speeds right these two speeds or angular velocities is higher that's not good that means the uh it's actually not that means it's actually not transmitting the whole power it's actually consuming or wasting a bit of uh, energy while doing this so because of that and the low operating angle since it's i can only operate um operate up to like 25 degrees with relative uh, relatively good performance and maximum it can go up to around uh, 37 and a half so because of that now we have the uh, constant velocity joints so constant velocity joints or cv joints actually have balls right steel balls traveling on like a cage and uh, raceways so this allow the this allow it to have less friction with uh, uh, more travel or more uh, operating angle so most of the time with when there's like when it's needed to have higher angle higher operating angle cv joints is the main selection but unfortunately these are expensive and heavier than the universal joint so only when it's necessary still use this type like front wheel drive applications and rear wheel drive independent suspension applications only in uh, such in other cases it's as much as possible still uses the uh, universal joints in most vehicles Okay, so with that, uh, the axle part, I think we are done. Uh, next, we need to discuss about the final drive. So final drive, most of the time, we do not actually discuss it as one component. It's actually a part, it's actually built into the, uh, trans, uh, into the differential itself. So, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, final drive, the purpose of the final drive is actually to uh, give the uh, final gear reduction, right? Final reduction gear while giving the final gear reduction. Uh, final giving the final gear, uh, gear reduction. It's also uh, turn the power transmitted from the turn the torque provided by the vehicle by 90 degrees and uh, directed towards the wheel, right? So that's what uh, one of the main reasons actually done by this final drive. So final drive, when we are calculating the gear ratios also, right? In order to find out the any, in order to find out the maximum speed or something with the maximum theoretical speed and everything, the final drive has to be calculated. So final drive is a very important part. These differential changes are not, important because all of these actually have the same gears right same number of gears so there's no gearing in this over here there are no gearing in the differential last gearing is at here right at here so yeah next uh, we move into the differential since the final drive and differential is the same uh, components or it's the same assembly so the purpose of the differential i know you already know main reason is to actually provide the differential uh, driving speeds for the wheels since uh, when it is actually traveling on a corner the outer wheel has to have has to rotate in a higher speed in order to travel longer distance uh, this uh, uh, free traveling capability is actually provided by the differential so i'm not going to actually go through more than that since this is like something you have learned like two five years now and uh, i have added few details you can read and one video i'm sure you might have seen this but i still added that video for you guys to actually discuss if you have any questions you can ask but i'm just going to go and discuss something more modern or more useful than this uh yeah so differential as she told uh, uh, used to actually provide differential speeds but but there's few disadvantages of this one main disadvantage is uh when there's 
when uh, this is operational it's always sends more power to the least uh, least resistant wheel to travel that means uh, less traction less traction means least resistant for wheel to move so more most of the power is always going on that direction so that means if one wheel is lifted from a rear wheel drive vehicle almost all of the power actually transmitted from the vehicle will actually go to that particular wheel so that's why when one wheel is actually lifted vehicle can't move to fix that there's few solutions are there very simple solution is in such case if you came across some case what you have to do is you have to put something between the road um, tire and the road and the wheel will start to send the power to the other side also then vehicle will move or you have to actually add weight to that side right? that's the only way you can actually move it but what we usually do is we push it from the other side right we push it from the other side you want it will work but you need to add more weight more power more people have to actually push it but what you should do is you have to add more weight into the other side and let it contact the road then it will automatically go by itself right that's the simple option but uh, that's not simple as it says so there were two different types of transmission or differentials were developed to fix this issue these are known as limited slip differentials and locking uh, differentials right so these two have two different applications actually two different applications i'll start from the locking differential now as i told you earlier the differentials main task is to actually travel let the vehicle to have differential speed but uh, it's possible to drive a vehicle without a differential as well right you can just weld it off or something still the vehicle will Uh, vehicle will work fine right vehicle will work fine you can still travel but you are traveling at a road or like a very well maintained road or something like a carpet road or something then the vehicle will difficult will be tricky to drive but if it is a loose surface if it is a loose surface the vehicle one wheel can slip and still go without any problem but um, uh, in such case has shown over here it's something like uh, extreme off-roading applications where you will having a very uneven road sort of things in such case uh, the forces uh, in most of the time there are no forces applied on some wheels so adding more weight or adding something to the between the wheel and the air yeah, is not the solution so such cases uh, they different a lock-in differential right locking differential so what the locking differential does is at all uh, once the locking differential actuated as shown in the image uh, the differential the output shaft right output shaft sorry uh, this uh, the crown wheel here this is the crown wheel or the final drive wheel will be directly right it will be directly as directly coupled Right, coupled to the axle itself so the axle is locked differentially is locked no differential application no differential working afterwards right afterwards there's no difference working because you can't op operate with the differential speeds now afterwards right so because of that at all times all wheels are, or the both wheels are getting the same amount of force right so advantage is wheels will be rotating at the same time driver can turn off and turn on at all time any time so that's one disad one big advantage so in a application like this right when you are going on off road it's very tricky you have to take like very steep uh, roads and you have to take like very tricky turns like right? very high turns smaller turns has to be made in such cases you need to be able to engage and disengage the uh, <clears throat> differential so the open differential usual the differential that uh, we talked about earlier it's actually called as open differential open differential allow you to turn without any problem so if you have lock-in differential that can switch off and on you can switch off when you have to take a uh, tight turn and switch on again and lock the differential 
to travel on a surface area like this right but if you uh, once you actually uh, engage all of these things it's quite difficult for actually to handle right it's difficult to actually uh, it's difficult to handle if you are traveling at a fast that's the disadvantage so but to fix that in the slick revenge of games so uh, i'm sure you might know what is this this is called as drifting so in the drifting sort of applications when you need to control the vehicle very well you need to have limited slip differential without that see you can see the vehicle is actually trying to travel in this direction while vehicle is moving that way right so the vehicle's automate traveling direction is this so to obtain that so vehicle actually the driver what he does is is trying to move the weight of the vehicle so when he is trying to move the weight of the vehicle the forces acting on both wheels are changing right both wheels forces are actually changed so even though this is actually happening since this is a road surface it should allow it to rotate at different angles but it should also lock right so to get that application you need to actually have something called a limited slip preferential so it's allow you to slip limitedly right up to a limited amount it's actually allow you to slip and take turns but also it actually locks when it's necessary right so it can be achieved in different mechanics some there are mechanically actuated hydraulically actuated or electronically actuated LS, uh, limited slip differential we call it as lsd right uh defense on that uh, application it's it's different so for applications such as this uh, the most suitable method is actually using a mechanical this the one actually shown here which is known as a friction blades or for like all wheel drive ray car such as this uh, uh what do you call this uh, subaru and lancer rivo something like that those actually have something called a viscous coupling because that too, they also need the power to send to different wheels at different times and to measure that they use viscous or fluid or hydraulics right and you have electronic measurements so electronic measuring means uh, uh, for like front wheel drive vehicles front wheel drive vehicles when all both wheels are locked together you can't actually turn right you can't actually turn but by having a electronically controlled differential or electronically controlled limited slip differential it can actually switch on and switch off the wheels giving the necessary locking characteristics to go faster on turn without affecting the handle right so that's very complicated stuff which you can learn later if you are interested in automobile but um, anyways so <clears throat> uh yeah yeah so uh this type of differential is very popular and it comes with like four wheel drive vehicles also use this up to certain extent can be used but there's very limited control or by the driver there's no almost no control if you are going like hard or roading you need a proper differential lock in differential so advantage is it's all wheel ness uh, will get necessary amount of power to keep driving this thing could not be controlled by the driver right as Uh, yeah. yeah differential actually have few adjustment i just put this you can go ahead and watch this one is this pinion wheel uh pinion wheel actually have something called a collar spacer you can just uh, you can actually um, the throw or the pull of the pinion wheel can be adjusted there and the uh, axle side wheel adjustments or this you can see this contact patch so this yellow color paint is applied and this uh, black color marks are the contact patch the contact patch has to be very well done so you can see this shown in ideal contact and poor contact is shown here so we need to have this ideal contact everywhere otherwise the vehicle become very difficult to drive and uh, bearing preload so how much of load actually applied on the bearing so if too much applied you feel difficult to turn the engine vehicle becomes slower because there's like a different gearing here so 
that becomes uh, increased by this uh, wrong assessment, adjustment. Uh, gear backlash. Gear backlash means uh, the gears have like a small play in them. So that play has to be perfect. This play is very important compared to the gears because of the uh, very uh, high gearing in here. So it has to be perfect in order to work properly. Uh, transfer case. So I have one question. Do you know what's the difference between a four-wheel drive and all-wheel drive vehicle? I think I have already discussed this. Yeah. So all-wheel drive means it will not send four power to all four wheels at all times. Only when it's necessary, it will be automatically sending. Uh, and it can be actually, uh, it may not be for 50-50 power. It can be like 50-40, like 40% power percent of the torque can be sent to rear and for 60%, sorry, 60 can be sent to rear and 40 can be sent to front, something like that. But uh, in the four wheel drive means at all times right at all times it's actually sending 50 50 of the torque to front and rear axle so all four wheels are getting the same amount of torque so to achieve this we have transfer cases so transfer case provide this 50 50 split right all wheel drive system does not use a transfer case they use a differential in the place of transfer case. So transfer case, one advantage is it can actually select whether you have to send uh, full, uh, whether it has to be front wheel drive or rear, I mean, four wheel drive or two wheel drive, right? So to achieve that, it actually has a small gearbox inside, right? It actually has a small gearbox inside and uh, you just have to select which gear, which uh, type of gear you would actually need to use. So these actually have something like this. So this is actually, uh, as you can see, this is actually a chain driven. Chain driven type power is transmitted through a chain or gear drive also there. So based on uh, the design, it can be either gears or chain driven type. Type This is actually different. The main purpose of it is to uh, provide this. And in addition to that, it can actually provide the gearing, right? So for example, if you are going on a very steep sleep, vehicle should be able to actually go over, that. should be over to go over that, then you need to increase the torque. So in order to achieve that, you have something like this, right? Planetary gear system to get that necessary gearing, right? Planetary gears are used here to get that necessary gearing output rather than using a normal, uh, normal, rather than using uh, that complicated gear system or the normal manual gear system by using this planter gear system it's make it compact right it's make it compact this is the mostly used application though. mostly used uh, type is actually this planter gears uh yeah with that uh, i think we are coming to the end of the transmission whole transmission or the drive line or drive whole drive train components if you have any questions you can actually ask yeah i have added few uh, details here you can actually watch and read especially most of these are actually related to this automated manual transmission with automated manual transmission we usually discuss it later in automobile uh, we have a special uh, module for this uh, transmission system it's a big component line Automobile drivetrain is a separate module for us, so that's there. So you guys can, uh, yeah, you, 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 you guys, if you are interested in automobile, you guys can do it. Uh,